Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God the Father and from His Son, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Those who say, I love God, but not my neighbor, are liars. Also, those who pray only for themselves and not for others are liars. Those are the hard words from the Gospel of St. John. And today our Gospel is taken from chapter 17 of John's Gospel. It is Jesus' last prayer, also known as his high priestly prayer. It's the last prayer that he prays in public before his death. Here he is praying for his disciples. Listen to Jesus' words. I am praying for them. I am not praying for the world, but for those you have given me. Keep them in your name, Father, which you have given me, that they may be one as we are one. He also prays for you and me. I do not pray for these only, but also for those who are to believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, even as you, Father, are in me, and I am in you. This, this text, this this high priestly prayer fits really well in the church calendar because we've just celebrated the Ascension and next week we celebrate Pentecost or the birthday of the church so it is fitting that Jesus here is praying for the church and for his disciples and all followers to come Jesus last prayer before his passion are that they may, may be one as we are one a petition that he repeats as many as five times in chapter 17 alone. God's absolute oneness in the Trinity is the perfect model of the union that should exist among all mankind. Here Jesus seems to grieve over and appeal to us to end the divisions and opposition among his followers. If the world does not believe in Christ, isn't this because we are not sufficiently united to Christ in his love? and joined as his family? Instead of reproaching others for not believing in Christ, we must admit that we bear very poor witness to this unity and bonding and love that is the sign that Jesus has been sent by the Father. We don't reflect that oneness in our lives. Gandhi was asked once what he thought of Christians. His reply, I never met a real one. Words in chapter 13 echo here. I give you a new command that you love one another just as I have loved you. You should also love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. You see, we have an obligation to our Lord as followers of Christ to uphold, to pull together, to encourage, to help, to uplift and be there for other members of the community with comfort, encouragement, and love as we bind ourselves together in the community of Christ, known as the church. This is Jesus' death wish, if you will, to be one as he and the Father are one. 
And each one of us has an important part to play in this, in this oneness known as the church. He placed you and me here now for a specific purpose. Maybe unknown to us this side of heaven. And he continues each hour, each second, each millisecond of our lives to work through us in creating this unity that Jesus prayed for. That we come together for one common purpose. And that is to share and live out the gospel of Jesus Christ. There's um, a children's book called Who Flew the Kite? And I remember reading this to Brendan when he was just a little boy. And maybe this will illustrate a bit about living together as Christians for one purpose. Who flew the kite? I did, said the sticks. I did said the paper. I did, said the tail. I did, said the boy. No, I did, said the wind. But they all flew the kite together. If the sticks had broken, the, ca the tail caught in a tree, the paper torn, or the wind died down, the kite would have crashed. Each had a part to play in, in the flying of the kite. I remember reading that book and to Brendan and I'd say, and the wind did. And after he got to know the book, he would say, no, they all did. We each have undone work to do as a community, as a follower of Christ in visiting each other, in, in giving, praying, preaching, gathering, even if only virtually during this time, and countless other measures in which we can share the unity of love of Christ. It is in this unity, the model of the Trinity, which is a perfect model for us, where we find true meaning and purpose for our lives. But we have to admit that we fall short. Hmm? Those we are called to serve too often seem to be the other rather than the neighbor. And God knows our poor human nature. And he knows that we all share it. Not, not only those who hate him, but we all share this human condition, even those of us who love him and believe in him. And so his blood continues to be poured out to save us from our sinfulness. Jesus ends his prayer with these words. The glory that you have given me, I have given them, so that they may be as one, as we are one. I in them and you in me, that they may be completely one, so that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Christ is not only in the Father, he is in us in spite of our miserable divisions and our sinfulness, Christ is in us. The world became flesh and dwelt among us. He is Emmanuel, God with us. There's a story about a man who sought God's direction for his life. And so he was told to go and visit a, a hermit monk in a high cave somewhere. It's an old Russian story. And after climbing into the cave of the hermit, the hermit gave him a flask and was told to fill it 
from the stream. And through that action, his life would have a sense of direction and purpose. Well, the man rushed to the stream. But for some reason, the water would not fill into his flask. And his pride kept him from going back to the hermit to seek more advice and to admit his failure that he couldn't fill this flask. So he traveled around the world searching for another stream of water that would flow into his flask. And he must have tried a hundred streams and he endured hardship and pain and suffering. Finally, he had enough. He returned to the hermit and he confessed to this monk that his sin of not wanting to admit that he needed help. I'm sorry, I tried to do it myself. And as he was confessing this to the hermit, a tear rolled down from his eye and it fell into the flask. And in a second, the flask was filled with water and the man understood what was the direction and the meaning for his life. You see, he saw that once he was willing to surrender, confess, and surrender his life to another and to forget his selfish pride, only then his life took on meaning and purpose. In spite of our divisions and our pride and our selfishness, God continues to be with us from the height of the cross. Jesus' words, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do, are spoken to you and me as well. This is the love of a God who can go on loving us, even though we scorn him and nail him to the cross by our sinfulness and divisions. And this same love of God is still present in the body of Christ as he promised. And remember, I am with you always until the very end of the age. He goes on loving, waiting, bearing with all of us who do not know true love and who pass by others in cold indifference. It is only in Christ can we hope for the unity that Jesus prayed for. It is only through the Holy Spirit working through us in this bond of love that he so desperately wanted his followers, you and me, to have. Can we truly live out the gospel of Christ? Now, during this time of social, of social isolation, we may, we may find it more difficult to practice this love and this togetherness and this unity. But the Holy Spirit can work through and around any barrier or, or obstacle. Already we have seen examples of the creativity of humankind in using art and music and technology to forge a new vision of togetherness. I especially enjoy the creativity displayed by some of the virtual choirs check out The Blessing on YouTube. And there are a number of them from different countries where brothers and sisters in Christ come together and sing and sing The Blessing, and it's absolutely beautiful. They are singing together even as they are isolated in their own homes. As followers of Jesus, you and I are, are meant to be like the giant redwood sequoias in California. They routinely reach 200 to 275 feet tall. And the tallest one is measured now at 369 feet. That's a tall tree. These trees have stood for hundreds of years, and some even were standing at the time when Christ walked the earth. Imagine that. They've been through winds, pandemics, earthquakes, fires, storms. Still they stand, these tallest of trees. Nothing seems to deter them. 
But what is so amazing about the Sequoia Redwoods is even though they are among the tallest in the world, they have a very, very shallow root system. Why do they keep on standing through fire, storm, and pestilence? Because even though their root system is shallow, their root system goes for great distances and they intertwine with the other roots of the other trees, forming a network of roots. They literally hold each other up. Our roots need to be strong as we journey through this time and beyond. Our roots need to be strong in Jesus Christ, and they need to be strong in each other. As we grow stronger together, we grow stronger in our individual faith. And as our faith grows stronger, we can reach out to others and help their faith to mature. And like the old song, they'll know we are Christians by our love. As we struggle with living out, Jesus desires that we be one as the Father and he are one. Know that we all struggle with the same human problem. While dedicated Christian communities like, like the church itself is an image of heaven on earth, we cannot forget that it is a paradise where we struggle. The crowning act of God's love for us is the cross of Calvary. And in this cruel paradox of love, Christ's prayer is buried like a seed in the garden, destined to grow, that they may be one as we are one. Since the Heavenly Father desires all to be saved, he calls to you today, If you have sinned and confess it, and in his mercy he will forgive it. As far as the east is from the west, your sins will be remembered no more. Maybe you have sinned through pride, like the man with the flask, who wouldn't admit he needed another's help. Only when he surrendered through his tears did that flask fill. Or maybe it's the sin of selfishness or inaction. You see that person in help as the other rather than the neighbor. Perhaps it's a sin done in darkness and secrecy. Maybe it's an ongoing sin you just can't seem to conquer. Confess it and be forgiven through the cross of Christ. And then, forgiving, having been forgiven and made a new person in and through the blood of Jesus Christ, share the joy you have the freedom you have, the living root system that you have with others so that they too may experience the joy of salvation and stand as tall as the Sequoia Redwoods through the fierce storms of life. God be with you. Amen.